Good evening. Um, I would like to start out with a disclaimer, which I know is the last thing you're supposed to do as a public speaker, but I would beg that I am not a crayfish expert. A crayfish expert actually studies astacology, and astacology actually comes from the Greek, meaning little lobster. And as I was poking around to come up with this presentation, I actually found these old Greek coins that had crayfish stamped on them. So what I like to say is this is probably more akin to where I am on being an astacologist. But an astacologist is an expert on crayfish. So these are the things that we're going to cover this evening. What is a crawdad? In fact, I got asked that question first thing tonight on how, what, is it a crayfish, crawfish, or crawdad? We're going to talk about that. Where they fit in the tree of life. What makes them a crawdad? Where you find them? Um, a little bit about their life history, their ecology, which to me is the most fascinating part, and a little bit on their conservation status. So the big question, is it crayfish, crawfish, or crawdad? Well, we, I love etymology. So if you go back and, and look at the root history of this word, it comes from the old High German krabis, which means edible crustacean. And in fact, today, the German Krebs is uh, German for crab uh, and fits with this early, uh, early history of this word. Now, the French call them crevice. And when at the Battle of Hastings, uh, the Brits heard crevice and misinterpreted it and thought they heard fish at the end. So they called it crayfish. At this time, the English language is all kinds of evolving and, and changing, and both of these terms are correct, crayfish and crawfish. Both are correct in the literature. What about crawdad? It's a little more colloquial. Uh, the best I can come up with in doing some research on this is that it refers to an old man sitting on the porch, you know, the old get off my lawn kind of thing, with these crawdads that are sitting in their burrows staring out. I, I don't know. It's, it's very entertaining, but the dialect is really dependent on where you live. In fact, part of a linguistic study that was done uh, by Bert Voss out of Harvard and some follow-up work with uh, Josh Katz had this question as part of an overall survey. So what do you call the miniature lobster that one finds in lakes and streams, for example, a crustacean in the family Asticidae? And it gave you some choices. Crayfish, crawfish, crawdad, or no word. What's interesting is that it really depends, as I mentioned, on where you live. Crawfish was about 35% of the respondents. Crayfish were about 23% of the respondents. Crawdad was about 19. There were about 4% had various other words, mud bugger as Larry mentioned earlier. My favorite, ditch cricket. Uh, there's all sorts of, of common names for this animal. But what's interesting is about 5% didn't have a name for this animal, which to me I find fascinating. Because there are about as many different types of crayfish in the world as there are different names. And I'll get into that in just a second. Now I thought I was a big crayfish nerd and had collected about two dozen different common names for this animal. But then I ran across an, a publication that listed 2,500 different common names. Now, that includes all the Native American terms. It includes all of the Australian ar Aboriginal terms, which there are a number of those as well. So what is a crawdad? This is in a book, uh, the very first a definitive book on crayfish was written uh, by Huxley in 1880, and my wife was kind enough to give me one of these books for Christmas. And in that is this quote, common and lowly as most may think the crayfish, it is yet so full of wonders that the greatest naturalist may be puzzled to give a clear account of it. This was over 140, almost 140 years ago. And I would say that this would meet uh, the same classification today as it did back then. So modern day philosophers, Calvin and Hobbes, this kind of fits 
with uh, Larry's story about catching crawdads as kids, which I think almost every kid that I have run across has done that at one point in their life. And it underlines the fact that we really don't know much about these animals. One of my coworkers um, that works in eastern Kentucky said, crawdad is something I put on a hook, crawfish is something I eat, crayfish is something I study. And I thought that pretty much sums it up. That does a pretty good job summing it up. So where do these animals fit in the higher scheme? How many of you have read Dave Barry? All right. Um, he's kind of on the right track. Lobsters and their crayfish cousins are not actually insects, but they are in the same category as insects at a higher uh, classification level. The big things I want to point out here, you guys understand that they're all crustaceans, but they're all in the order decapod, which means that they have 10 feet or 10 legs. And all of the ones in Missouri are in the family Camberidae, and that's what I'm going to concentrate on tonight are the crayfish that are found within Missouri. So, some characteristics of decapods. Terminal claws on the first three appendages, meaning the big ones that you guys are, are probably well aware of or have gotten pinched by, but what you may not know is this next two pair of legs also have little claws on them. Their gills are encased in this branchial chamber. That's very, uh, a key characteristic for these. Shrimps, spiny lobsters, crabs, and crayfish all fall in the order decapod. Who's hungry? Okay. There's a whole industry that has grown up around the raising, cooking, and eating of decapods. So again, within Missouri, all the ones here are in family Camberidae. There's about 375 of those uh, found worldwide, uh, most of which are in North America. Most east of the Rockies, there's a big hub in the southeastern part of the United States. And then there's another smaller hub in the Missouri and Arkansas Ozark. So, what makes a crawdad a crawdad? It's interesting that they do have a head and they've got a thorax like most invertebrates. However, they're fused together into what's called, what's called a carapace. And so you've got the carapace, which is the big hard part, and then you've got the abdomen, which is the yummy tasty part. They're hard because they've got an exoskeleton made of uh, chitin, which is a calcium carbonate material that they have to shed in order to grow, helps protect them. Their eyes are up on stalks and they're compound so that they can see predators. And we'll, when we get into their ecology and what eats crayfish, you'll see how important it is that they are very aware of their surroundings. They've got two different pair of antennae that they can actually use to find food, mates, but also detect predators. They can chemically sense predators uh, within the water. Gills, as I mentioned, are in that branchial chamber enclosed in the carapace, which means that they can survive outside of water as long as those gills remain moist. Ten legs, which we talked about, but those big honking pinchers, they use those for defense to keep that smallmouth bass from eating them or another crayfish from pulling them out from underneath the rock. They use them for mating, which we'll talk about, and they also use them for burrowing, which we'll talk about. And then that very muscular tail with the fan at the end that they can propel themselves very, very quickly um, away from your net or, or away from your hand. Now you can actually tell the difference between male crayfish and female crayfish, between the crawdaddies and the crawmamas. Um, male crayfish have appendages that are attached on the first segment of the abdomen, these are called gonopods. They use these for reproduction. They change size and shape depending on the time of year. And these are the key structures that taxonomists use in order to identify these animals to species. And this isn't unique to crayfish. It's um, a lot of invertebrates. They look at the male reproductive parts uh, in order to classify them. Now females, on the other hand, have this annulus ventralis. So during the mating process, it's like a lock and key system. And you have to have the right key for the right lock in order for successful reproduction to occur. Females also have these gonopores at the base of their walking legs. And these females will produce these eggs internally. They will mate. She will fertilize those eggs as she extrudes them. 
during, in the spring, and that happens in these, those little holes right here is where she will actually extrude the eggs. So if you've got, if you go out and you collect a crawdad and you want to know if it's a male or a female, just flip it over, and if you see these rod-like structures, you have a male. If you don't see those rod-like structures and you have a little pocket here, you have a female. All right, so let's talk a little bit about how these animals are distributed. There's about 650 species worldwide. Now, that's not a hard and fast number because taxonomists are either lumpers or splitters. There's always work being done to classify things, reclassify things, and occasionally we get new species that are found or described. But 650 is a, a good rule of thumb. We've got over 380 of those in North America. Think about that. Almost 400 of the 650 are found on this continent. This is the epicenter for crayfish distribution. Again, most are east of the Rockies. Most are in the southeast U.S., um, with the two hubs being the Cumberland Plateau and the others being the Ozarks, as I mentioned before. So there's actually three families of crayfish that are found worldwide, and I only bring that up because of this really weird distribution pattern that hop skips and jumps across the world, across the continents. Two things that I want to point out. One, Peristicidae is found only in the southern hemisphere. The other two are found in the northern hemisphere, but they don't have this continuous distribution. You have Asticidae, Camberidae, Asticidae, Camberidae. And the best that they can figure is that these animals were all together as when it was one big supercontinent and the continents split apart and drifted, and then you started having this sort of speciation occur. I don't know, but that's what, that's what the experts say. Now, I'm a big sports fan, and to put this in perspective on some of our neighboring, neighboring states, um, Missouri used to be part of the Big 12, and as, as we rank for crayfish distribution or crayfish crayfish richness, species richness, we were doing pretty well. We were holding our own. But then the powers that be decided that they wanted to switch conferences. And we went down to the bottom of the list. Now, this is not really that surprising when you think about it. The southeast U.S. is the hub for not only crayfish uh, species richness, but also mussels and fish. It's just the diversity is amazing when you get down into some of these uh, southeastern states. So here, we've got most of our species are found in the Ozarks. 28 of our 36 species are found in the Ozarks. What's interesting is we've got eight of those species that are found only in Missouri and nowhere else. And then we've got 12 others that share very limited distribution with Arkansas, Oklahoma, or Kansas. Within the boot heel, we've got another 11 taxa that have been described. We do have some that are found only in the prairie region, eight. And then we've got five that can be found in the big rivers, the Missouri, the Mississippi, and the Lower Grand. Now, one reason that Missouri is, is as diverse as it is is because of where we sit in the nation. We pick up some of the northern species in our northern part of the state. We pick up some of the western species um, on our western borders some of our southeastern species down in the boot heel, and then we have the Ozarks, which has a tremendous amount of diversity. So I always say Missouri is where everything kind of comes together, and so we get a little sampling of everything around. Now, since this was for folks that have a true love of the Missouri River, I wanted to highlight some of the Missouri River species. There's not that many, at least that use the river on a consistent basis. We've got two, the devil crayfish, which is a primary burrower, pretty common along the floodplains of the Missouri River, and Orconectes immunis, the paper shell crayfish, which is also found, it's a prairie species and is very common along the uh, floodplains and within the Missouri River proper. Another one is the virile crayfish, or the northern crayfish, which is our most widespread, most widely distributed uh, crayfish that we've got in the state, and so it will occasionally uh, be found within the Missouri River as well. Now, I would say that there are, because of 
most of the streams in Missouri flow into the Missouri River, there stands to be a pretty good chance that some of these other species could be found as they get mobilized due to high water events, get essentially flushed into the Missouri River and, and be found there as well. But these are the three that you're most likely to find if you were uh, to have a flood event and get out onto the floodplain and, and pick them up. These are the ones that you'd probably find. But more specifically, where do you find these crawdads? I put this in here because while crayfish aren't normally found on land, I mentioned that as long as their gills are moist, they will crawl around. And almost every spring after a rain event, I'll get a phone call and it's almost always from a preschool teacher that says, I found this crayfish crawling around in the parking lot and it has all these eggs attached to her belly. So you can find them on land, but that's not where they make their living. Essentially, if you have water, you've got crawdads. Whether it's a lake, a stream, a ditch, a swamp, a pond, chances are good you've got some crayfish. Now, they will distribute themselves depending on how old they are and what species they are. Some really prefer streams over ponds. Some really prefer rocks over logs. So they've worked themselves out to find their own little niches, their own houses and homes within this water. We do have some animals that you don't necessarily associate with water, and these are these animals that burrow. First of all, all crayfish burrow. If you've ever had a crawdad in a tank, you will know that they will completely reconstruct, deconstruct, move things around every night. They're little engineers. So all will try to at least get underneath a rock or underneath a log or some sort of shelter because of where they sit, they don't want to get eaten. There are some that uh, for example, females, when they have eggs, they will burrow because they want to protect those eggs. They want to get down below the frost line during cold uh, weather events. Or if the water body dries up, they'll burrow down just to make sure that they can keep those gills moist. That's most of, the, most of the crayfish we have in Missouri. We've got four or five species that are considered secondary burrowers, which means during flood events, they're out in open water. When those ephemeral pools dry up, those crayfish burrow down. Into the, into the banks. So when, you, when I think of crawfish production, and, and again, remember, crawfish is something that I eat. If you go south of Missouri and you say crayfish, they'll look at you like you are speaking a foreign language. It's crawfish. So the crawfish production utilizes these secondary burrowers. During the spring, they will flood the fields, they will plant rice, um, the crayfish will come out, they will mate, they will do their thing, and then during the fall they will drain those fields, those crayfish will, um, but well, they will collect those crayfish as much as they can to sell for food, they will drain the fields, the crayfish will burrow and go back down. Now we do have three species in Missouri that are primary burrowers, which means they spend their entire life within the water unless they happen to be near a preschool and it's raining, then apparently they will crawl out and go across the parking lot. Now what's interesting is we've got several different burrow types here on the screen. Uh, most of the ones are what are labeled C. They will just go down to hide and keep from being eaten. The secondary burrowers are more like A, B, and C here on the right. Multiple tunnels, multiple openings, chimneys on the top where um, they've removed that dirt, removed that clay, and burrowed it up behind them. On the left, that's an example of a primary burrower. Multiple openings, multiple tunnels, uh, chimneys on the top, but they have this really large room. And that's kind of the characteristic of these, that they have a man cave to hang out in. And it's usually right at the water line. So I've got a series of slides here that actually show a devil crayfish burrowing. So here's the burrow. And I didn't take these, by the way. I, I, I got these from somebody else. So here's looking at the top of the burrow. And you see the claws? This is a crayfish coming out, and he's got a little mud ball on his claws. So he, oops. So he comes out. There we go. He comes out with that mud ball as he's dug it up with his claws, deposits it here on the side, packs it down, and then crawls back down into the tunnel to get more mud. 
So you end up with these adobe chimneys. Now these can go down 20 feet deep. These tunnels can go down 20 feet deep because again, they've got to get down to that water table. Um, multiple tunnels, primary burrowers has a large room. We talked about that. Uh, what's interesting is during really dry periods or cold, period, cold periods, they can actually close that thing up and keep that cold air from coming in or uh, to keep them from desiccating and keep their, their little habitat moist. So as, as you've mowed or have property along a stream or maybe even out in a field and you see all these little clay chimneys, chances are good you've got a crawdad or multiple crawdads that are down there uh, digging down to the water table. Now we've also got three species of crayfish that are found in caves. Again, not something that you would inherently think of. Um, there are a couple species that tend to like caves. They will go in, hang out, probably eat because they've got a captive audience in a lot of cases, and then leave. They don't have any change of eyes or color or any other morphology changes. However, again, as I mentioned, we've got three species in Missouri that spend their entire life in a cave. One of which was just discovered 20 years ago, 15 or 20 years ago, and just described within the last 10 years. All the taxonomy was done and the publication and all that stuff. So we actually have a brand new species that's found only in Missouri, um, one of these cave species. And it's, it's the only one of that genus that's found west of the Mississippi, which if you're a crayfish nerd like me, that's kind of cool that we have one that's, that's kind of an outlier. Don't know how it got here? Probably here all along. All right, a little bit about their life history. Um, another question I, common, I commonly get is, how big do they get and how long do they live? Well, the how, how big they get is pretty dependent on what you have. We have some of the largest crayfish in the world. We have some of the smallest crayfish in the world. We've got some dwarf crayfishes that get no more than an inch long, even as an adult. We've got some, the long pinchered crayfish, which is found down in the White River drainage in the Ozarks, that gets to about seven inches long without the claws. So with the claws, you're adding probably another three, four, or five inches. Uh, so you can have an animal that stretched out is probably about a foot long. Not bad to eat. Um, but the largest crayfish in the world is actually found in Tasmania, and it's called the giant freshwater lobster, and it can get 12 to 15 pounds. I mean, it's, they get lobster size. Very long lived, take a really long time to mature and reproduce. Uh, a lot of issues that are going on as far as habitat destruction there. Uh, for us, most of them live two to three years. That's our best guess, um, if not consumed by a predator. They grow during the summer months. They really slow down during the winter. Um, so if you're going to catch crayfish, actually the, the fall is the best time to do it when the water temperatures cool down. They're not as active, but they haven't started to burrow down. When you wait until spring and waiting for the water to warm up, a lot of times they're still buried underneath rocks and they're a little harder to find. Um, as you probably or can appreciate cave species, because their metabolism is a lot slower, tend to live a lot longer, in some cases 20 to 25 years. So life cycle. I'll start in the spring. Keep in mind this is a big circle, but I'll start in the spring because we're in the spring now. Um, March and April, the females will extrude the eggs. She will actually lay those eggs. Um, and the, the magic number for water temperature seems to be at about 8 degrees Celsius or 46 degrees Fahrenheit. Um, at that point, they're like, hey, we need to start moving into growth mode rather than into hibernation mode. So right about now, May and June, those eggs um, will hatch. And when those eggs hatch and start to spread out, then all of the rest of the population go through a synchronous molt. So they have to shed their skin. So this means that they're very vulnerable to predation and are hiding and they're not out walking around looking for other things to eat. And what the theory is is that this allows these animals, the little animals, a little better shot at making it, that they can spread out and not get eaten by something else. Come fall, there's another molting period. Um, at that point, the, the older members of the population will die off, the three and four-year-olds, so to speak. Um, 
You'll notice on here I've got F2 and F1, and I'm going to talk about that. That has to do with the reproductive form of the males, and that's tied directly to the time of year and this molting cycle on whether or not they're in growth mode or reproductive mode. Reproduction occurs in the fall, and we'll talk about that. And then, again, once that water temperature hits about 8 degrees Celsius or 46 degrees Fahrenheit, they really start to slow down and go into, hey, I need to crawl underneath the rock and sleep until it's time to, to wake back up in the spring. Now, during those winter months, the females are developing those eggs that I talked about before. So she's in the mode of, okay, I have mated, but I haven't created eggs yet which seems like a really weird timing thing. So just keep that in mind. All right, molting. How many of you have found a molt, a crayfish molt, and thought that it was the actual crayfish? I have on multiple occasions. Because they shed everything, down to the skin over their eyes, to the coverings on the antenna, and, and it looks like you've got a little crayfish there, except there's nothing in it. And so what happens is, you start to get a little break between the thorax, which is the hard part in the front, and the abdomen. And eventually, that widens enough that the animal then, that kind of splits open and the animal crawls out of that. And at that point, they're really soft. Um, if you have them in a fish tank, when they molt, that's usually a death sentence because the other fish that you've got in the tank will just pick them apart because they're all nice and soft and, soft and chewy. So here's some pictures. We've got, um, on the left, we've got the actual animal on top and the molt on the bottom. And then on the right, it's just the opposite. We've got the molt on the top and the actual animal on the bottom. Now, the other really neat thing, when they molt, they can actually regenerate appendages. So it's very common for these animals to lose these claws because they're constantly fighting, they're constantly fending off fish, they're constantly fending off raccoons or otters or anything else that wants to eat them. So it's, it's pretty common for them to lose these legs. And they will then regrow. And occasionally you can find them with just a little nub of a, of a claw sticking out. The other thing I mentioned that this molting does is affect the reproductive cycle. So for crayfish in Missouri, they molt in the fall, and the males move into what's called a Form 1 or reproductively active form. So, remember early on I talked about how you can tell a mama crayfish from a daddy crayfish. If you got a daddy crayfish, those gonopods get, go from this blunt, hard, calcified structure into something that's soft and pliable. So if you go out in the fall, and you collect a crayfish, the first thing you do is you flip it over because you want to know whether you got a male or a female. And then you can look and touch or use forceps to determine whether or not it's actually in the reproductively active form. Now, if you're a crayfish nerd like myself, it's this reproductively active form that you need in order to properly identify it. Now, you are probably only going to have three to four species of crayfish in any given stream. So once you get familiar with what you've got in your stream or in your pond, you probably don't have to go through this whole process. But to start out with, this is how all the keys are developed, are by using these males that are reproductively active. Um, so when the male is in this reproductively active form, he's got one thing on his mind, and it ain't eaten. So he's patrolling the bottom looking for a female to mate with. If he runs across another male, he's going to try to mate, and then the claws come out, and they're going to fight, and whoever is bigger usually is the winner. Now, if it's a female, it'll come across this female, and again, try to mate, come across this little courtship thing where they'll grab at each other and whatnot. Eventually, because the male has larger claws for the, um, the same size male, and if a crayfish is the same size, male or female, the males will have larger claws. And they'll use those larger claws in order to flip the female over, and he's got hooks on the, his walking legs that he will then they'll lock into this position and he will transfer the sperm to the female. Now this can last for anywhere from about 15 to 20 minutes up to a couple of hours um, if left undisturbed. Now once that happens the females are going to 
physiologically start to change as well. She has glands at the base of these swimmerettes, or the little, these little appendages here on the tail, that act like glue. And so it's going to extrude that glue, and that is where she will attach the eggs. All right. So this is happening during the winter months as she's developing the eggs internally. Then she will extrude those eggs through those gonopores, and then at that point, she fertilizes them. So it's an external fertilization done months after the mating occurs. So she's able to keep that sperm viable for several months during the winter time, and then we'll, um, we'll fertilize them in the spring. In berry, that's what a female is called, because they look like clumps of grapes. They can be dark like this, they can be orange, they can be black, cream colored, it depends on the type of crayfish you've got. Anywhere from 40 to 50 eggs up to a couple hundred, again, depending on the species and the size of the female. Now, after a couple weeks, those eggs will hatch, and you have little baby crayfish that are attached to the abdomen by a little thread. And these animals at this stage go through three different molts, each one looking more and more like an adult crayfish. Now, once they reach this third molt, they're actually a free living organism and could theoretically leave the mother at any time. But she's exuding this pheromone that keeps the, the babies close until they're ready to hatch or to uh, escape out on their own. And then when she releases that or quits releasing the pheromone and the babies start to spread out, then the rest of the population molts and hides underneath the rocks. And so you've got three or four hundred little baby crayfish per female starting to spread out and find their way into the world. Which brings us to where they fit in the food chain. So the first thing that when we talk about uh, what they, uh, where they fit is what they eat. And the easiest way to put it is crayfish eat everything, um, which makes them really good for an aquarium because they'll, they'll eat anything that you put in the tank, including your other fish if you're not careful. So they will eat plant matter, they will eat animal matter, they will eat dead and decaying matter. The interesting thing is they can take some of this plant material, this alochthonous material, the stuff that falls into the stream or the, the lake or reservoir, they can chew that up, get some nourishment out of it, and what they excrete can actually be utilized by other animals because it's in a smaller format or a more granular format that still has nutritional value for these other invertebrates. So the other important thing on ecology is what eats crayfish? Again, the answer is pretty much everything. The fish, probably a, a dead giveaway. All right? There's a lot of fish that eat crayfish. There's a surprising number of birds, particularly shorebirds, that eat crayfish. However, I have seen owls eat crayfish. Um, it was a small stream. We were sampling. I didn't even see the barred owl up in the tree. It was getting to be right about twilight. And it came down, hit the water, and flew back up into the tree. And I looked at the gentleman I was sampling with, and I, was, I said, does it have a crayfish in its claws? And sure enough, it had a crawdad, and it was munching on it. We have found crayfish in the crops of turkeys. Now, I'm not sure if the turkey was going after the crawdad, or if the turkey was going after the gravel for its crop and ended up with some crayfish. But regardless, we found crayfish in, in turkeys. Um, reptiles, amphibians, a lot of mammals, including humans, eat crayfish, and that the seven miscellaneous species, those are other invertebrates. There are some dragonflies that prey specifically on those little baby crayfish. So, to get on a little soapbox, you've got this animal that feeds on multiple levels, multiple food sources, assimilates all that energy, and provides it in a nice package for a whole lot of other animals. And because of that, we call them keystone, keystone animals. Crayfish eat everything. Everything eats crayfish. If you walk away from nothing else, hopefully this slide will, will stick with you. Um, this is why we have some of the best, in, not just smallmouth fishing in the Ozarks, but some of the best fishing in North America. We've got some of the highest densities of crayfish anywhere in the world. They process all of this 
other material that comes in and, and provide some nutrient recycling. And in, in one study that was done on the, the Big Piney River down in, um, down in the Ozarks, the production, the amount of energy available from those two species of crayfish was more than all of the other invertebrates in that stream combined. Think about that. You've got animals that are, you know, will fit in the size of your hand, providing and really driving that whole system. Um, and not just the fisheries, but all of the other things that rely on those streams as well. So the removal of that animal would dramatically change the way that that whole system functions. To me, that's, that's incredible that these little tiny animals can do this. However, we may have some of the highest densities, but we also have some issues uh, when it comes to crayfish and their conservation status. This is probably a slide that many of you have seen before, um, and it's not surprising that about three quarters of the mussels are under some sort of conservation status, but crayfish are right behind them with over 50% either, we've got a couple that have gone extinct, but endangered, threatened, or have some other sort of species of conservation concern status applied to them. So about 50% need some sort of protective status. And this is nationwide, all right? Or I'm sorry, this is within North America. However, within Missouri, 19 of the 36 species that we've got fall within this category of needing some sort of conservation protection. We have as I mentioned, 36 species. But if you remember, it's very uncommon to find more than four or five, and in some cases, three or four per stream. We've got some animals that are limited to portions of watersheds, and that's the only place they're found in the entire world. The other thing that we have done is we've altered the system. We have moved in as human beings, and we have also moved things around. So let's talk a little bit about this introduction, particularly introduction of crayfish. Um, when we talk about introduced species, I think a lot of people are really good at grasping things coming from overseas. You know, it's exotic. It comes from Europe. It comes from Asia. It comes from South America. I think we've gotten better at realizing things coming from other states. We can grasp that. What I'm talking about are moving things from across the hill. So animals that are all native to the political boundary of Missouri have been moved around within that political boundary in areas that they normally are not found. Um, we have documented 35 cases of this, and it's growing. If, it's one of those things, if you look, you'll find it. Um, and these are, these are all animals that are, again, not only native to Missouri in some cases, the top two are found only in Missouri, but they've been moved into watersheds that they're not historically native. So let me tell you a little story about some work that I did. It feels like 100 years ago. There's two species that are found only in the upper portions of the St. Francis River, so down here in the southeast part of, the U of Missouri. What's interesting is you've got these two animals that not only are they limited to the upper portion of this watershed, upstream of Lake Wapapello, within that watershed, you usually find one or the other. We only found them together in a handful of streams. So you've got these two animals that have already got a really, really narrow distribution. And what, what happened is we've moved, at some point, an animal from the neighboring watershed, probably the Black River immediately to the west, moved it over into the St. Francis River watershed. And so, this was some early work that was done that they've, they found this woodland crayfish, very limited portions within the St. Francis. This was the result of some of the work that I did and found out that that animal has spread. Came back, did some follow-up work, and it has spread even more. What's interesting is where we find this introduced crayfish, we see declines of native crayfish, and some, in some cases, exclusions of other crayfish. So you've got one replacing the other. Some work that's not shown on here is some work that my wife did looking at this crayfish, which has been introduced in 
Crane Pond Creek, which is this little sub-watershed here. And she looked at the effects of that introduced crayfish on the other bugs, the stoneflies, the mayflies, the midges, and found that, hey, you know what? This introduced animal is not just wiping out crayfish. It is fundamentally changing the makeup of the, ba the food base in these streams which is the first time that's ever been documented, uh, not only for the species, but only been doc the only time that's been documented here in Missouri. So don't move stuff around, even if it's across the hill, because you may inadvertently be releasing something into an area that it's not supposed to be. Another one that has been spread around a lot is the White River crayfish. Uh, it's native to the areas that are shaded and brown. All the places that we put the skull and crossbones it are areas that we have found it that it has been moved throughout the state. So again, it's, it's an animal that is native to Missouri, but has been moved to areas outside its native range. And what we have found is that's, that can be kind of a hard concept for people to get their brains wrapped around because it's a native crayfish, right? It's a native animal. And yes, it is, but you gotta think watershed level. You know, These animals have been moved outside of areas that they don't normally belong. So how do they get moved? Um, aquaculture is a big one. I, I have made a couple of references to crayfish being very, very good aquarium animals, and they are. It has generated a large business in selling crayfish. Um, and if you go online and, and you know, type it in, you can find all sorts of stuff. You can find some of our endangered crayfish online that people have gone and illegally collected and are selling as pets and making good money at it too. Um, now, uh, well, I'm getting ahead of myself. So that aquaculture trade has moved some things around. Fishermen have moved things around, dumping bait when they're done because they want to be humane and don't want to dispose of or kill uh, the animals that they're using, and so they, they dump them. Believe it or not, a lot of schools um, are a vector for this. They will get these animals in to look at for the semester and then toward the end of the year or the end of the semester, they don't have the heart to kill them. The kids have gotten attached to this crayfish or crayfishes and they release them. Um, pet industry, aquaculture, that kind of goes hand in hand. What about kids? How many collected crayfish as kids? I did. How many of you had parents uh, maybe have to start taking care of the pet because all of a sudden you lost interest in it? I'm sure I fall into that category as well. We think this is how that animal, that uh, the woodland crayfish, moved from the Black River into the St. Francis River. Johnson shut-ins is a 15-minute drive from Ironton, and that's where it first showed up was in downtown Ironton. So my guess is it was kids, went over, collected crayfish, brought them home, got tired of them. They look an awful lot like the crayfish that are found there in Stouts Creek right there that runs through town, and off you go. All right, now they do very, invasive species do very, very bad things once they get in there. They can beat up, physically pull somebody out of their chair or underneath a rock, you know, and, and be the bully in that situation. They can outcompete them for food or for habitat. There are some reproductive advantages that can occur. Um, one of the things that they found with this woodland crayfish is that it actually has changed its life history, its life cycle in its new environment and gets a jump start by about two to three weeks on uh, releasing the young. The young are bigger, they get released earlier and therefore get an advantage over the native um, young once they are released. And there are some, uh, recently there's been some evidence that there's hybridization going on as well. So a lot of bad things, a lot of bad things going on. So. Why is this such a big deal? It's one crayfish replacing another crayfish, or they're eating other bugs. Well, they can spread disease. Uh, the crayfish from North America carry a, um, is it a fungus? A fungus that has, as we have moved these animals from North America to Europe, there's only five or six species of native crayfish in Europe. We moved our native crayfish over there spread this fungus that their crayfish were not immune to, and it, it has just wiped them out. It has done really, really bad things over there. Um, 
they can change, completely change the fisheries. There are documented examples of the rusty crayfish, which is native to the Ohio River, Ohio River Valley, that has been moved to multiple locations outside of its native range, particularly in Wisconsin, where they have mowed down vegetation, they have completely changed fisheries, and communities are losing out on millions and millions of dollars a year because fishermen are not going to these lakes to catch walleye anymore because the walleye are not there. They, they, they can't reproduce because the habitat has been altered. I, and I have read uh, some reports of this rusty crayfish is so aggressive, they've had to close down swimming beaches because they will pinch the swimmers. <laughs> yeah. And by the way, these crawdads, are, they're, they pinch hard. A um, little bit on regulations, I just want to bring that up because the agency for which I work is responsible for enforcing this. As of 2014, if you are to go to a bait store and if they are selling live crayfish, this is the only one that they can sell, the virile or the northern crayfish. Um, it is the most widespread and so it was the one that was chosen that if you're going to sell crayfish, this is the one that you're going to sell. If you have a valid fishing license, so if you're age 16 to 65 and so you've got this valid permit, you can go out and collect up to 150 animals a day. I don't know what you would do with 150 animals a day because it's illegal to sell that 150 if you're collecting them from the wild. But if you want to start your own little whatever in, in your basement with baby ponds and you know have your own anytime you want to go fishing just go down there and collect crayfish to go go fishing I guess that's what that is for um, you can collect them by hand you can collect them with bait and traps you can dig for them I've got a whole thing on on that that I'm not going to get into tonight on how to how to actually collect them because I wasn't figuring with a group that loves the Missouri River that you're going to go down to the big muddy and start collecting crayfish it's to me I thought that might have been a little bit of a stretch um, Keep in mind, it is also illegal to transport animals and release them into another water body. So there are actually some rules and some laws and regulations that apply to this as well. But they make great bait. They make fantastic bait. When I go fishing for smallmouth, I use crayfish imitations. Or if, I can, if I've got a net and some, something to hold them in, I'll pick up a half a dozen crawdads and use them for fishing bait while I'm there. Um, and you want the little ones, the ones that are about an inch and a half to two inches long total. You know, the old adage, big bait, big fish, there's a lot to that. But if you want to catch fish and bigger fish, use those smaller ones. With that, I would be happy to take any questions. I've got a whole lot more information I could bore you with. I've developed a two-day workshop on crayfish, so it was a challenge to get it down to the time period that is allotted for tonight, but I'd be happy to answer any questions that you guys might have.